You'll find out in a minute what a marvelous person she is. Let's recognize her once more with our applause. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker. We were proud to confer upon her an honorary Doctor of Humanics degree just a couple of minutes ago. You've already heard about a number of Dr. Hurd's accomplishments. Additionally, she received the National Public Citizen of the Year Award and the William Bennis Award for Leadership Excellence. She is the Vice Chair of the Board of the National Mentoring Partnership and has served on numerous other boards, including a two-year National Board Chair and continued board member for the Points of Light Foundation. She's a trustee for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and earned a master's degree from an extremely prestigious institution, Springfield College. I'm proud to present Dr. Marion L. Hurd. Good morning. Somebody said, woo, well, I'm going to wake you up if you had nosed off. So I'll say it again, good morning, and let me hear you respond. Good you know, my minister always said, if you don't get a response to good morning, just go home. <laughs> and we live too far to just go home. So I am really happy to be here today. I can't tell you what a privilege it is to be back at Springfield College in this role. Now think about it. You graduated, you paid your tuition, And you come back to get an honorary degree and you're a commencement speaker. How cool is that? It's very cool, very cool. I want to also acknowledge the trustees, the administrators, the teachers, the faculty, anybody who has a title around here who does anything of any importance at Springfield. I also want you to acknowledge my husband. Stand up, honey. He always says, don't make me stand up, but I have the microphone. Stand up, honey. Here he is. <laughs> In August, we're going to be married 50 years. Think about it. I know. 5-0. But I tell people, no matter who I meet, no matter how handsome they are, no matter what a man might say to me, I don't have to look for hamburger outside of my home because I have steak at home. You know, at Springfield, we always talk about the spirit, the mind, and the body, right? I got the spirit part. I was baptized in an early age. I got the mind part. I was always not a good student, a great student. Because in my household growing up, if you got terrific grades, great grades, you didn't have to do any chores. So I got that early. I have to tell you, though, I'm still working on the body part. So I'm here today just to share a few thoughts with you because this is your day, a momentous occasion. And I want to get you out of here pretty quickly before that professor, and you know who I'm talking about, discovers that he or she made a mistake with that grade they gave. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. But I want to share some thoughts that have helped me along the way. And in a tradition of helping that this school is known for, I want to share a little story. It's about a married couple, Fran and Art. And they were married 45 years when Art retired. Fran had worked for 35 years and raised four children. And after she retired, she started volunteering for the United Way in the Children's Hospital. Art, on the other hand, was just tired. So he said to Fran, I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna sit in the easy chair and watch TV and drink beer. I'm tired. He got his gold watch, he retired and he did just that. But Art started to deteriorate. He slumped in the chair and he didn't move. Fran, on the other hand, would go to her meetings. She would line up the children at the hospital and read to them. She would make sure that community organizations donated products and services so that children would have health care and understand that people wanted them to get well. Fran was the typical community volunteer, the quintessential person who cared for others. And Art continued to deteriorate. He stopped shaving. He stopped bathing. One day his brother came to visit and said, Art, you've got to get up and get out. You are floundering. 
And between the brother and friend, they got him to the doctor. The doctor took him in to the examining room, and one hour later, now imagine a doctor that spends an hour with you. So this is in many ways a fable. <laughs> so after an hour, Fran is frantic in the waiting room. And the doctor said, Fran, I need you in here. So Art came out and Fran went in. And the doctor said, Fran, Art is fading fast. He doesn't have any interest in anything. You have got to give up your volunteer work. Forget about others. I want you to cook a meal for him every day like you would find in a grand restaurant. Meats and vegetables, salads and breads and desserts. I want you to be romantic and find a lovely negligee and tell Art you are a loving wife. I want you to stop seeing your friends during the day and concentrate on your home and Art. And Fran was shocked to think that she would have to give up a life she had built after working and raising children. And said to the doctor, doctor, what will happen if I don't do that? It's a lot for me to give up. And the doctor quietly whispered, Fran, Art will die. He's slipping away. So Fran left the doctor's office, went out into the waiting room, and collected Art. Art wanted to know what had kept Fran so long, and so they went down the stairs to the parking lot and got in the car. Art couldn't stand it another moment. He said, Fran, I'm going to pull over. Tell me, tell me, what did the doctor say? And after all those years of marriage, after companionship and raising all those children, Fran looked him in the eye and knew what the doctor said about what she would have to give up. And smiled at Art when she said, baby, you're going to die. <laughs> and so I tell you that to tell you how to hold on to things. Hold on to what you know is right in terms of giving and in terms of giving back. Others are going to get in the way. Too many meetings, too many commitments, too many trips, too many obligations. Others are going to get in the way. I'm not saying to save the world. The world today is a very scary place. My husband and I have traveled to 41 countries all around the world, from China to Latin America, all over Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, all over. We've seen how people live. We've seen children running around barefoot. From South Africa to Russia, we've seen people who aren't eating and in housing conditions that anyone here would say would be deplorable. And so as you seek your path to helping others, hold on to it. And in your world of work, hold on to your traditions and the things that you hold dear and what you have had reinforced right here. Have a core. How do you think the people feel who went to school with the inside traders? Nobody thinks that the person sitting next to them would behave so badly. I had a chance to have dinner with Martha Stewart after she got out of jail. Do you think I had a few things to tell her? I only wish I'd spoken to her a year before she went to jail. Those of you who are old enough to remember the movie star of the 30s and 40s, W.C. Field, know he was a big drinker. His nose gave him away. He was a wild individual. And everybody said, you're never going to heaven. You have missed the mark with your behavior. And he was a young man in his 60s when he died. And his friend went to see him in the last week of his life and was shocked to find W.C. Fields reading the Bible. And the story in Hollywood says that the friend asked him, what, what are you doing? The way you've lived, how you've carried on, how you've treated people. What are you reading the Bible for? And W.C. Fields is reported to have said, well, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> well, I don't want you looking for any loopholes. I don't want you trying to cut corners. I don't want you trying to skip things. That's not what you learned in your life and it's not what you learned here. The people who stood up, who are part of your lives, would be so disappointed in you for looking for loopholes. Life is not always fair, 
but life with good health and a focus is there. And so the opportunities abound. Now I want you to do two things. The people who stood up are probably planning a party for you. Well, those of you who have a job, raise your hand. I want to see who has a job. A lot of people have a job. Those who don't have a job, come on, fess up. <laughs> there are a few who don't have a job, just a few. Those who have a job and those who will get a job, I want you in the next two checks to send this college a donation. Make it 50 bucks and don't skip it and no shortcuts. Why? Because we know where you live. <laughs> and you want to see these buildings. You want to see these grounds be maintained. I'll tell you why. I'm proud to say I graduated from Springfield. I would not be so proud to see boarded up buildings again and crushing debt. Give back to your school as I have done. Could I give more? Yes. Would I give more? Yes. But just a little more. <laughs> we have children and grandchildren, the most precious gift of all. The other thing I want you to do, and don't forget, write that check. Because if you don't, I guarantee you somebody will call you. The other thing I want you to do is treat the people who have supported you. And I don't care if it's Chinese or Kentucky Fried Chicken or pizza. I want you to host something for the people who have supported you. I want your name on the invitation to say, I understand how lucky I have been, and in a gracious manner, say thank you. You have got to be humble about this gift of education. Do you know 98% of the world's population will never be here? And every 15 seconds, a child dies around the world from unclean water. So we are very lucky people to be sitting here in Springfield, Massachusetts today. We have been given gifts that some people can't even imagine. You have positions and titles, and now another piece of paper that says to the world, you are bright and special. I am so happy to receive this honorary doctorate degree. It's the last of my colleges to present, my, present me with one. And you know, I can call myself doctor, even though the people right along here had to write dissertations and do a lot of work. I tell people, yes, you can call me doctor. Don't get sick. <laughs> You just ask me hard questions. But I will tell you, it's great making hotel and restaurant reservations. So the last thing I want to tell you is, fast forward your life. My husband and I have already written our obituaries. Why? Because our children live out of state. And we are together so much that we've told our sons we could very well die together. They're, they're fairly close in age, and. They were in college at the same time. Now think about your tuition and multiply it. The tuitions were so expensive, we could have bought Rhode Island <laughs> and had change. <laughs> and so our obituaries tell a little bit about how we feel we've lived and the challenges we've had along the way. So our sons and daughters-in-law won't have to struggle with what do we say about them when they're gone. You need to sit down and write your obituary. You need to think through what you've done yesterday, what you're doing today, and what you plan to do tomorrow. Why? Because someone else will have the pen and paper if you don't do it yourself. And in those lines, in those words, there should be a measure of the time you gave toward other people. There are people who are never going to sit in these chairs, never going to march that march. I said to Doug, the chairman of the Board of Trustees, my goodness, it's of military precision with all the graduates coming in. And it's a beautiful sight. I've probably spoken at 30 commencements. And I will tell you it's a proud moment here in America to watch young people with great minds. Well, I haven't met all of you. <laughs> and so. When you get a chance to do this as a guest, it is indeed a rare privilege. So let me close by saying just one thing. We want to thank you for upholding the values here. And as you go out into the world to do whatever it is you're going to do, we know you're going to make us proud. 
You've already made your family proud, and prouder still will you be when you set your sights on a course of action, whether it's a job or a community leadership or keeping your family together or helping children or finding a way to give to others something that's missing in their lives. You're the voice, the voice often, of the powerless. So I will close by telling you two things. President John F. Kennedy, and it's on the wall of the Kennedy Library in Boston, talked about our journey. Could be a thousand steps, but it begins with one. And the last is one of my heroes, a great American, a fellow who appreciated audiences and appreciated the talent that he had been given, even though some would say in later life he squandered it with his personal choices and personal behavior. And that would be one of my favorite singers, Elvis Presley. My husband couldn't understand why I wanted to spend a day at Graceland. I said, because some people have gifts, gifts that they can't imagine and give them away. Some people have opportunities and they don't know what to do with them. Some people have a family that supports them and they turn their backs. But not Elvis. As you know, and it's legendary, when he played Las Vegas, when he played the bowl in Honolulu, when he played any arena all over the world, what did he do? He closed by acknowledging those who had helped him come out, bought tickets, and supported him. And I'm going to do the same thing to you as I congratulate you and send you forth to do great things, to be a greater person, and to acknowledge those who have helped you along the way because we all know we could not have and did not do it alone. So in the words of the great Elvis Presley, I will close by simply saying, thank you, thank you very much.